beautiful um, spring afternoon. So good evening to everyone and welcome everyone from all corners of the globe. Today, we are honoring an amazing recipient who's done incredible work within her community and her professional field. She's not based in South Africa, but she definitely tries, tries as hard as possible to connect the two worlds, um, the international world as well as South Africa together. Um, today, we are part of our leadership conversation series where we're going to be acknowledging our 2021 Distinguished Alumni Award recipients in honor and acknowledgement of how they've embodied the motto of where leaders learn. So I hope everyone is excited for tonight as we welcome one of the 2021 Distinguished Alumni, Miss Heloise Henning Emden, who's currently the manager of internationally sponsored research at the Charlton University in Ottawa, Canada. If you have any questions for today's session, please definitely do drop them through. If you've got any congratulatory comment, of course, we welcome, we welcome. If you've got any ululations that are still stuck deep in your throat, we better hear them, we better hear them. She needs to hear them from all the way in Canada. If you're wondering who I am, my name is Unondomeko Wagakuma Ano CBC. I'm a broadcaster, storyteller, as well as the founder of OK Show Media and a Rhodes alumni G07. This specific series is made possible by Rhodes University's division for communication and advancements, simply fostering productive lifelong relationships with our alumni. So it's gonna be an interesting uh, session this evening because uh, Miss Heloise's life is quite interesting. It's quite interesting. She has been able to thread a career that sees itself from journalism to development, and of course, working with the international community. I'll let our reading of the citation happen with Miss Dorothea coming through a bit later on, who's gonna tell us more about why we celebrate Celebrating and ululating for this specific um, alumni. You will know by now we definitely are doing things a bit different in our conversation. In this third installment, we're putting a bit of a twist. You've seen um, the VC, Dr. Susan Mabizela, join us. You've seen uh, Professor Suri from the Commerce Department in the, um, in the university's um, Commerce Department coming through for these conversation. And today we have none other than Dr who is the president of the Rose University Convocation. Um, so super excited to have her today, Dr. Michelle Aretas. And uh, if you're not too sure what the convocation is or what exactly do they do, they are a statutory body which meets at least once a year to discuss any matters affecting the university and to convey its resolutions to the university council. If you want to be part of the convocation, it is definitely possible. You can be in contact with us at www.rhodesuniversity.co.za where you can find out more um, from the registrar of how exactly you can become of the Rhodes University Convocation. It's time for us to really take agency and be part and uh, take stock of the purpleness that we come from. So super excited. What I love most about um, our facilitate, our our person leading our conversation today, Dr. Reitis, is that even herself, her interests are in human and organizational behavior, then diversity, as well as justice-based leadership. Um, so I'm super excited to see these two amazing women talk about access and knowledge networks for development, some lessons for higher education. Some of the points that will be touched on is technology intervention and access knowledge networks and of course enabling environments for access to knowledge beyond ICTs in higher education. Just for everyone joining us right now, let me just take a recap of how exactly our events are going to go through. So we're going to be welcoming the reading of the citation by Miss Dorothea Hendricks and then we're going to follow through with a congratulatory speech by Dr. Cesar Mabizela and of course get into Miss Heloise Henning's life and story and times at Rhodes University before handing over the baton and the question and answer session to Dr. Reitas, who's going to be leading this conversation and really facilitating and getting to the nitty gritty of what we have here to say today. If you at home want to comment, you can definitely send through your comments. It's not just about us, it's about the whole international community coming together to celebrate the specific significant human. Um, our special acknowledgements before we kick off, we'd like to make special acknowledgements to the Rhodes University Chancellor, members of the University Council, members of the Board of Governors, and of course, the executive management of the university. 
And on behalf of Heloise, I'm super excited to also acknowledge in the audience her husband, Clive Emden, um, kids Ben and Jenko, brothers Theo and Lex Henning, her nieces and nephews. And of course, a special acknowledgement to Rich Fuchs, her mentor and first boss who recruited her to work internationally. He unfortunately passed away yesterday. So we'll definitely like to send our condolences with that regard. Rich, if you're not too clear about his involvement, he was part of the hub that held together the ICT 4D team globally. Some of them might be here amongst us with the congregation. So if you're here, thank you so much for joining us and for acknowledging some of the amazing people that are part of your life. Also, Ms. Heloise would like to also acknowledge in the audience her community leaders in South Africa, Dorothea Hendricks, as well as Soweto Pastor, Dr. Trevor Ngoona, and other co-nominators that were along with Miss Dorothea. So without any further ado, I'm just going to pop back on our behind the scenes and I call Miss Dorothea Hendricks to the fore to have our reading of the citation. Dorothea, you did this nomination. You, <laughs> I'm sure you caught Eloise by surprise. Thank you so much for nominating such a formidable woman. And I'm sure across this conversation, we will get to find out more about why exactly is she such a distinguished alumni. But uh, let's have you read our citation and of course, kick off our night this evening. Thank you, Nontebeko. Greetings and gratitude to you, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Mabizela, and congratulations again to you, Dr. Reitis, for your recent appointment as President of Convocation. It gives me great joy to present the citation to the Rhodes community of a worthy recipient of this award, Eloise Henning Emden, and special honor to our late professor, Professor Nancy Charton. Eloise joined Rhodes University in 1976 to study for a Bachelor of Arts degree in political studies and philosophy. As fate would have it, her activism was quickly sparked by the nature of the South African political landscape at that time. As a student during the 1976 South African context, Eloise became engaged in the student formations that advocated against the removal, the forced removals in the Eastern Cape. She also got engaged in the SRC organized volunteer program to tutor township learners and she met them in Fingo village where they lived, although this was not the only risky um, place, but illegal at the time. Rhodes University did not only provide a foundation of formal knowledge for Eloise, but also seeded in her a deep sense of commitment to social justice. Soon after completing her undergraduate degree in 1980 at Rhodes, Eloise joined the CSIR as the liaison officer responsible for coordinating cooperative scientific programs and issues related to freshwater ecosystems. Between 1984 and 1990, Eloise moved into journalism and made her career in political and economic journalism at the time when apartheid was being challenged from all fronts. She worked for BUILD and then also SAPA, South African Press Association, as a reporter for Parliament, then Business Day, and eventually a small independent magazine, Cross Times. It was during this period that Eloise experienced the relentless power of the media and seized the opportunity to amplify the voices of the voiceless. In 1990, equipped with a media experience, Eloise sought to work in development and joined the Development Bank of South Africa, where she found herself enmeshed in the reconstruction process. During this time, she worked closely with the communities such as supporting Bush Park Ridge Radio and working with telecom regulators in Southern Africa in their quest for providing universal services and access. As a telecommunications specialist at the Development Bank, Eloise gained a wealth of knowledge and expertise in understanding the African context, in particular the institutional barriers to regulations and infrastructure that could hamper the efforts to bridge the digital divide on the continent. 
between January 2002 and October 2012, Eloise then joined the International Development Research Center, we know it as IDRC, where she quickly moved up the ranks from the position of program officer and specialist in the South African Satellite Office in Johannesburg to being a program manager. Acacia and Connectivity Africa, and for and, and and for innovation for inclusive development in Ottawa, Canada. Eloise championed the mechanisms that help program teams focus on regulatory and infrastructure issues to integrate ICTs into governance, education, health, economic, social, and cultural development. Eloise recognized the urgent need to facilitate the networking of researchers across Africa to tackle telecommunication regulations, electronic medical records, university connectivity, as well as connectivity in rural and remote communities. Through Eloise's active participation and engagement, several networks were seeded and have continued to evolve into sustained organizations, notably Research ICT Africa, Ubuntu Net, Alliance, and Open MRSs. In a current position as manager for internationally sponsored research projects, Eloise has significantly improved the reach of Carleton University in Canada's internalization through securing multi year sponsored scholarships that enable our African PhD scholars from across the continent to benefit from the university research programs and research placements. Eloise is an international facilitator supporting researchers to the global to be global players and who has not forgotten her roots and continues to work tirelessly to ensure that Africa benefits from the various networks that she has established across the globe over the years. Eloise, in addition to a Rhodes degree, holds a Master of Arts degree in Development Studies from the University of Wits and a Postgraduate Diploma Policy and Program Evaluation from Carleton University in Canada, where she works now. She has not only written extensively, but has also published papers on the topic of ICT and development. She's a non-executive director, tertiary and research networks of Southern Africa, also known as TENET, and a member of the Canadian Evaluation Society and National Council of University Research Administrators, Washington, DC. Eloise also works with various charities, community development centers, a historically disadvantaged university in South Africa, to provide evaluation to support student services and research capacity development, as well as facilitating workshops on various social justice mat matters. Eloise, congratulations. I met you at Professor Nancy Charton's home. We've kept in contact and besides all these accolades of you, you're just a human being that loves connection and networks and loves your children and your family. And we wish you all the best with this award and we wish our Rhodes University and community that God's blessing be upon you. Thank you very much, Don Tobiko. Thank you very much. That was absolutely beautiful. And for those of you who are watching and you probably think that Dorothea looks a bit familiar. Well, yes, she's also a Rhodes University alumni, but her time at the university goes back to 1977 and 1979 and then back again in the 80s. So yes, she's got purple blood running straight through her. But without any further ado, let's go hop on and invite our VC to come through and start off with the ululations and the chair VC Ugub, there you are. Come through, come through. Welcome, VC. Thank you very much, uh, Nandiobego. Family, friends, and colleagues of uh, Ms. Heloise Emden, Rhodes University alumni who are joining us uh, virtually from all corners of the globe, fellow South Africans, Rhodes University leadership, staff, and students, 
And of course, our distinguished alumna, Heloise Anden. Rhodes University honors and celebrates its alumni who have achieved distinction in their chosen field and have demonstrated exceptional leadership and dedicated service to their profession and humankind through the award of the Rhodes University Distinguished Alumni Award. The award acknowledges the recipient as an outstanding role model for current and future generations of Rhodes University students. The recipient should exemplify the attributes and values of social justice, empathy, kindness, decency, integrity, honesty, compassion, civility, and human solidarity. These are the attributes and values that Rhodes University seeks to inculcate in its graduates. The personal lives, professional and personal achievements and contributions of our honorees set them apart as truly distinguished graduates of the university where leaders learn. This evening, we are singularly honored to recognize and celebrate one of our own, Ms. Eloise Henning Emden, as a worthy recipient of the Rhodes University Distinguished Alumni Award. Throughout her life, she has placed her knowledge, skills, and expertise at the service of humanity and has made a positive change. She is a force for good. On behalf of our council, chancellor, and the entire Rhodes University community, I extend our heartfelt congratulations to you, Eloise, on your well-deserved recognition by your alma mater with the Rhodes University Distinguished Alumni Award. Eloise, we would like you, your family, your colleagues, and the whole world to know just how immensely proud we are of you and how deeply honored that to count you among our most distinguished alumni. Your efforts will contribute to our collective objective of realizing a better society and a better world. Your alma, as your alma mater, we salute you, we honor you, we celebrate you, and we commend you for all that you are and for your personal and professional achievements and for your exceptional contributions to our nation and humankind. And above all, thank you for flying the flag of our university with great honor and with distinction. Once more, hearty congratulations, Eloise. I thank you. Louise, I don't know. I don't know when last have you heard halala 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 halala. I don't know. I, I don't know how to translate it in Canadian. <laughs> but I hope you're receiving all this beautiful energy that's coming your way. And I hope it pretty much sets the tone for this specific evening. So we're super excited to be in conversation with you. And I can't wait for you to join hands with Dr. Michelle Aretas, who's the president of Convocation who is going to be in conversation with her. I know you and Michelle have very specific interests, particularly on today's topic. So I'm super excited to see how it's going to happen. As you know, Dr. Reitas has a long um, a career working on policy and academic related approaches to development in Africa. And today she's gonna to be helping us um, navigate and comb through the necessary conversation that will happen today. But before I do invite her, I wanna just hand over the baton to Heloise to tell us snippetly about her time at Rhodes before her and Dr. Reiter's kick off this evening's conversation. Heloise, halala, halala, halala. Congratulations. <laughs> Nanta Beko, those sounds are just uh, full my heart. Thank you so much. Um, and good evening and good morning here in Canada. And thank you so much, Vice Chancellor Mabizela and uh, Dr. Reiter for facilitating um, this incredible opportunity for me. 
I want to also just take this moment to thank Luanda Biele, Manager of Alumni Relations and Stakeholder Engagement, Communication and Advancement for his gracious and generous leadership in putting together this event. Dorothea Hendricks, my nominator and um, all the other people who nominated me, I just really want to thank you. And to, um, to Rhodes student and family, hi. <laughs> um, I also want to acknowledge the land that I live on in Ottawa, Canada. It's unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The people of the Algonquin Anishinaabe nation have lived on this te territory for millennia and their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. And I here want to give honor to those people, to the people of the Algonquin Anishinaabe nation. And I acknowledge Rhodes University as my alma mater where I was awakened. Since hearing about the nomination and being awarded it, I have spent a lot of time uh, reflecting. And I have to say, I'm very surprised also by this nomination. I can think of at least a handful of other people, and I hope they're online today, who deserve this prestigious award. Rhodes peers who are in you know, prominent scholarly positions and amazing leaders of their communities. So <clears throat> I think of myself more as a facilitator, um, you know, working in the background, getting people connected uh, to collaborate and, and to get them funded so that they can be stars. I think of myself more as a, a bridge builder, um, you know, someone who connects the dots, a relationship manager. So to be recognized for playing this support role is a great honor. So ever since I was contacted by Dorothea, um, who told me about this, I've been reflecting on my time at Rhodes in those years, 76 to 81. They were, they were tumultuous years. I came <clears throat> from a bilingual home, but I went to an Afrikaans school. And when I arrived at Rhodes, I was one of two young women who'd arrived there from Afrikaans and who were at Macy School in Pretoria. I grew conscious, became aware of myself sociologically and aware of the world in which I was functioning. South Africa was going through its spring the Soweto riots, death of Biko, black consciousness, mass funerals, riot police, SANDF in the townships, the Craddock Five, the relentless suppression of the Band AMC and, and an Afrikaner state religion, control of the SABC, kufuts and ratals. And yet glimmers of change, the Vian Commission that enabled uh, you know, uh, uh, black labor unions to be formed, uh, Braden Bradenbach, the division of my identity split, threatened to split me apart. But in Grahamstown, I started becoming painfully aware of the privilege into which I was born. I identified the students who were seeking ways to subvert the government. Some got arrested and jailed. I had a boyfriend who fled the country to avoid being drafted into the army. And then the autumn, autumn of 1980, after the South African military invaded Angola, I wrote, a poem. I'm going to read it to you. It's short. It's in Afrikaans. I will translate it. It's called Hafs. It means fall or autumn. Hafs. And he laat met haar son in this Hafs sterf tolle jong manne in Angola. Net jy word gespaar, want ek het jou begrawe onder ooker blare. Fall. In the late afternoon sun in the fall, while several young men die in Angola. Only you are secure because I buried you under leaves of ochre. By the way, Andre Brink actually published this poem and several of others in the Rhodes Afrikaans Poetry Magazine. I wish I still had, had copies of them. But that poem, I think, sums up the emotion behind the passion that has driven me in my work. And I think my work has been to, re to repair the damage of what was done in apartheid. This poem is a reminder to me that there's feeling about my work. And Rhodes was such a perfect place to learn about the people that I care about. We 
we did not just go around building systems. We were we we cared about people and the work that I that I'm passionate about. The work that makes me go to work every day is about this caring for people. Turning back to Angola and Mozambique, where the SADF planted many mines and fought against the frontline nations. I was privileged when I started working in international development to be able to travel and support work in Angola. I worked um, with a, a development workshop and, and a, a Canadian um, Angolan NGO, and we were able to bring satellite communications into Wamba, which was the, the theater of the war in, in, um, in, in Angola. And we traveled, you know, and skirted roads that still had landmines in them that were planted there by the SADF. We couldn't take the mines out, but we could put communications in to enable people. So uh, this was the social context in which I was um, awakened at Rhodes University. And thank goodness for you know, the stability of someone like living in Nancy Charton, who was the head of African politics, living in her cottage. And that's where I met Dorothea. And though I had gone through the struggle and rejected state religion and became an atheist, Dorothea taught me that God is love. And, and it's this Grahamstown, Makanda. It's a world within a world. It's set back off the beaten track, away from capital cities and the throng of passers-by but it holds in it an old worldly charm. It's not a backwater. It, uh, it, it holds in it, the, in, the, in the town, Rhodes University stands at the one end of High Street and the church down the road. And they're in constant conversation with each other. This is where I lost myself and found myself. And so I am a proud alumni. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you so much, Ms. Heloise, for sharing such a poignant and beautiful lived experience. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, Dr. Ratus, I won't take too much of your time. I'm just going to hand over to yourself for you to officially kick off our conversation with Dr. Heloise, specifically on that note. Welcome, Dr. Michelle Ratus, and please do enjoy the conversation. Tobacco. It is such an honor to represent um, the convocation at Rhodes this evening, and I hope that we have many more conversations like these over the next few months. Um, Heloise, congratulations, and your passion is palpable. Even over ICT and over the thousands of kilometers that span between us, I, I admire your resilience. I know where you started. Your story gave me a picture of who you are and who you continue to be. So I am, I am so, I feel so robbed that I'm not in the same room with you having a conversation over a glass of wine as Professor McKenna was suggesting. But let's start talking about Africa um, and, and technology because Africa is often seen as a consumer of knowledge, of technology, of information. And yet your world has shown that Africa is producing all the information and the knowledge that it needs in order to engage with the world. So tell us a little bit, a, a bit about the technology interventions that, that you have been involved with. You're on mute? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, uh, the program that I joined in uh, the 2000s was actually uh, to support research. Research was, was uh, and, and there was a lot of a lot of opportunity to do some action research as well, so interventions and research. Um, and and our program supported researchers in Africa to explore how digital communications could contribute to development, to human and organizational development, as well as to how uh, policy and governance was was required um, uh, to support that development. So uh, you know many of the outcomes, such as greater access to education, learning. And most importantly, formal knowledge. I mean, one of the one of the pieces that I think I'm very proud of that we worked with other funders to support was uh, 
helping universities in Africa create in, uh, institutional digital libraries. Because at the time, I'm talking early 2000s, uh, if you looked at those, those bubble maps of where publications were, Africa was this funny little narrow strip and didn't contribute content. And we were very interested in um, how to support uh, that formal knowledge, um, be, be, you know, the content becoming part of uh, the, the global internet. So we thought, you know, we were researching, we were working with activists in the field of access and control of copyright and, and publications, of ownership, of open access, uh, open source as a public good. And, and we looked into the limitations that were there, um, the limitations for African researchers. One of my, my colleagues, and I hope she's here today, Katie Bryan, I mean, her field is, uh, you know, why African scholars don't get published. And we looked into ways of, of, of you know, trying to understand what the, the norms and conventions are that, were, were, that restricted African publication. But I can say that because we were opening that can, you know, I think uh, we can now talk about how evolution in that field has, you know, has happened. Um, we supported researchers to understand how vulnerable people could, could in marginalized groups and women could gain security by having access to, uh, to telecommunications. But the reverse as well, how people would become vulnerable because they had access to communications. Um, so we, we supported researchers to understand how ICTs were empowering um, or not, you know, uh, and eventually, you know, we had to start also looking at the unintended outcomes of internet uh, connectivity, you know, factors that uh, that affected uh, negatively with it, that had unintended outcomes, such as, you know, the issue of privacy, if you're going to create digital records, electronic medical records of people, how do you secure their digital privacy? Um, how do you, uh, you know, how do you uh, secure uh, uh, plan programs around uh, um, individuals so that they, so that their 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 identities are secure, you yeah. know, and uh, all the un unintended things that that were happening around us, you know, hacking, but governance of the internet and and concerns challenging, you know, um, the challenges of the authoritarian control of the internet. How do we govern the internet so that it be, it remains an open space for for uh, for growth for development, um, you know, so, ten, ten years ago, we, ten years ago, uh, IDRC stepped out of the or Canada stepped out of this uh, program because by then, you know, we'd seeded, we had participated with many other funders and we'd seeded a lot of knowledge and I think that's that's the pleasure to step back now and look at those uh, networks that continue to thrive. I mean, that, that's the aim of development, that you can actually walk away and know that you have a sustainable project at the end. I'd like to hear about your Mozambique project with the University of Edward, um, Eduardo Montane. Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting one, because when we think about Mo Mozambique, we have very clear ideas about what we're going to find post-conflict. Um, lots of struggle now with political insecurity, um, you know. So the development that came in the, in the 2000s with the ports and the infrastructure and the mining has suddenly started to dissipate. So it's wonderful hearing a, a positive story from Mozambique. Yeah, thanks for that. I, you know, um, I want to acknowledge Rich and I want to go back to speaking about him when I can. And I'm not going to stop now because I, I really want to give him space in my in, in my contribution, but he, Rich was a telecenter activist. <laughs> Rich Fuchs, who, who, as I said, passed away yesterday and was my mentor, was the man who opened up the opportunity for me to start working internationally, you know, coming from South Africa where the borders were closed and in, in, you know, up until the 1990s and then being able to start working in Africa. So I remember going to a telecenter in, in the Manika province, which is about an hour, two hours drive from Maputo. And uh, it had been established before I joined um, uh, uh, IDRC. And um, they, they, the, the way in which the project had been set up, there was a monitoring and evaluation system and the, and the, 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 the telecenter manager was marking people who were coming in. And I know that our funding was, was also helping them because they uh, they could for the first time get 
internet connectivity. But by the way, that costs $2,000 a month to have an ISDN line from Maputo to Manika. And uh, as I went in, it was quite a bustling uh, um, uh, community, uh, uh, community uh, like a little building where there were lots of people sitting around these computers. And uh, I was with uh, Marielle Rowan, who, who, who was the uh, interpreter and the local project per person. And I said to the guy, you know, how, are you able to sort of generate income from, from this community? Because, you know, to, to sustain that internet connectivity is going to be really, really difficult eventually when the, the funding dries up. And he said to me, well, they didn't have any connectivity at that stage. The line ha had been down for a month. And I said, have you complained? And Marielle stopped and she wouldn't translate what I said. And I, and I said, why are you not? interpreting what I said and she said you don't ask someone whether they complained against the government so I thought oh my gosh I you know I did something wrong and uh, when I went back to Maputo um, I spent time with with the you know, we, we we had a very strong partnership with the the university uh, Eduardo Matlana of Anancio Masinga um, Amerigo Machanga, um, Jamo Makoma um, and they were in the ICT department and I said to them, hey, you know, the, this telecenter is paying this fortune to get internet that's not working. What can we do? And they said they'd start a, a, a laboratory um, project and we funded them and they started testing uh, these various lines that were going to uh, community centers. And, you know, I tell that story because it was a little research project. This was the kind of seeded funding that IDRC made possible. And today, Americo Machanga is the, he's the, uh, he, you know, he's the director general of the communications regulator <laughs> in Mozambique. So all I'm, I mean, in that vignette, I'm trying to tell you that, that the, the, the interactions we had with people who were on the move doing incredible things you know, building up uh, their um, contribution to the development of Mozambique. That's, that's the pleasure of um, the work that we did. Well, I'm, what I'm hearing is that small, small actions have great impact that we might not see within the immediate period of the project. Mm -hmm. But years later, you see that. Um, you also reminded me of the inequalities that COVID has so sadly exposed around ICT, around access to information, around access to learning platforms. You work quite closely with ICT and higher education. What are some of the initiatives that you have around that? Because we can't, we can't pretend now that COVID has happened that things are okay anymore. There are such big divides within in the world. Well, now you're reminding me that, uh, you know, the, the theory of change that, uh, that I think we all kind of clung to at that piloting stage was, you know, build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. It reminds me that it, that's an insufficient description of um, what, I, what access to ICT means. It's, um, it's just not that way. I actually, um, it was mentioned in the citation, I sit on the Tenet board and I see that Peter Clayton, who is also a member of that board, is uh, present here today. Hi, Peter. Um, I, I just have to say, I mean, there's higher education, South Africa, caring for and um, managing huge digital resources which keep universities connected. But that doesn't mean that the students are connected. That doesn't mean, I mean, even if we have ubiquitous, presumably ubiquitous cellular telecommunications, it doesn't mean that in, 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 um, uh, that, that in COVID, uh, South African universities were able to, able to pivot online. Actually, I was working with Manga City University of Technology at the time, uh, you know, I, I still am, but uh, uh, as an as Academics Without Borders volunteer from Canada, I work with a, a group of um, um, uh, people at Manga City University of Technology. And we actually did a, a, a cost a benefit analysis looking at what, what it you know, what the benefits to education would be if they just were able to get their students online. 
Um, but these are more difficult things. These are layered issues of governance of the university, telecommunications operations and prices and deals that were cut with the government and you know access to, to computers. These are very complex issues. And you, 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 you don't just solve problems by even creating the access. You also then have to create the content. You have to create the educational um, uh, or the pedagogical approach that would, that would integrate ICT so that it's still the teacher, the book, and the learner who is interacting. You know, it, it's, it, it's a more complex, I mean, to me, that's the highest level of systems meeting each other and uh, how complex it is to to achieve that kind of um, uh, how, how can I say uh, educational value or value for students um, so ICT connection is is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for development Absolutely. And I'm sure you were reminded about your days at the DBSA where we provided. I'm, I also worked at the DBSA for quite some time. So we provide the infrastructure and wonder why it's not working. It's because that link is, is, is gone. The systems thinking link is, mm. is not quite there. I want to acknowledge what um, Dr. Matutu is saying on the, on the chat that um, she mentions that the IDRC is very inspiring instrumental in, in Africa still. And also she mentions that the African Open Science Platform um, that is hosted by the NRF is, is also working quite hard on, on data intensive open science. So I want to give it back to non Tobacco because I feel as if I'm hugging you and I'm sure there are so many other people want to ask questions, but I'm, I'm always here just in case we don't have any questions on the chat, but non tobacco. I think we're all just feeling a bit greedy with Heloise this evening. I don't mind. I'm not even complaining. Have her. I think we all definitely should have her. But some of the comments definitely coming through. I definitely congratulate messages coming through. Like you've said, um, Matutu is saying that the IDRC is still playing a big role in getting the African continent to speak with one voice, um, get connected to the globe, and still sees research programs. Other players, such as the International Science Council and Kodata, are involved in this initiative. And and uh, after that, Katie is coming through saying, hey, your ability, Heloise, to understand ideas outside of your own field and see the possibility for innovation is one of your most incredible strengths. Heloise, you have helped many of us get to where we are now, myself included. Thank you so much. So Katie also including and pouring on her cheers into the conversation right there. Another one saying your passion and emotion of your recollections of RU reminds us that a higher education is about becoming and not just knowing, in inverted commas. Apart from that, um, a lot of people saying such a poignant reminder of our dark history. Thank you so much for sharing. And that, of course, comes back to the poetry and the poems and the lived experiences that you opened up this session with. And I think if you agree, Dr. Reitus, is that it's time for us to move on perhaps to the next part of our conversation talking more about knowledge networks and perhaps why collaborations matter and why they're so critical, particularly when you talk development. Over to you, Doctor. Thanks, non -tobacco. Um Heloise, there was a question coming from non -tobacco about knowledge networks. Yeah, so uh, I want to go back to uh, sitting in the DBSA offices and um, I had been uh, approached by Rich Fuchs, who as I say, is my mentor and the person who, uh, you know, who opened doors for me to start working internationally, um, who I eulogize today. I'm grieving for him and his wife, Claire. Um, but I wanted to say that he saw in South Africa, he said, how can we be closing down the South African IDRC office and not keep ICTs for development open? Because look at this. South Africa had, uh, you know, Tabo and Becky were, had committed to bridging the digital divide in, in, the, in, the, in the G8 uh, events. Um, Mark Shuttleworth had just been an astronaut and had developed, you know, Ubuntu uh, as an open source uh, uh, um, um, operating system. He said, that's where this innovation is. We need to keep it going. But there was also a reluctance 
to be to be supporting a, a, a country that had already gone through its transition and was you know get on its feet. Um, and so the, the the point was that we we needed to fund you know Mozambique and Angola. That's priorities were there, and I thought hard about it and I wondered how I could how I could network people like you know my other alma mater peer Alison Gilwalt who uh, you know had been a regulator and was working at uh, Link Center at Bits University and was was training people and understanding you know the challenges of of policy uh, and how policy could be a blockage or an enabler uh, in terms of you know telecommunications rollout and and access as uh, and and you know so I I I thought about it and I said, well, you know, I know these people in Mozambique and I know these people in, 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 in Malawi and Kenya, and maybe we should just get them together. And that's how I would say the whole idea of building knowledge networks evolved. We couldn't really fund projects in South Africa, but we could, we could support knowledge networks growing and people in, in other countries benefiting from these conversations that, that we were co-creating. We were kind of figuring out you know what is unique about Mozambique how would they how would they be how are they challenged in terms of their policy uh, environment in terms of their frameworks and you know research ICT, uh, ICT Africa which to this day is you know a jewel in the crown of IDRC's work um, you know established those networks that literally ran from the Cape to Cairo and you know peer networks of of researchers who who learn to peer review each other's work who did uh, you know um longitudinal studies in countries together that's what i mean about um extending knowledge networks beyond the boundaries i think icts made us realize that we weren't stuck in our national environments we had to deal with we had to deal with you know the 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 policies in our national environments but what but we could we could reach beyond our national borders and then you know it was through you know it was again it was through connections through building relationships i mean i was uh, you know um hiv and aids we were living through the hiv aids pandemic and i was working with some researchers at uh, uct and and medical research council who um who who initiated the thought about how to track uh, uh, patients who had gotten on to uh, antiretroviral therapy so that they could ensure lifelong uh, treatment and they were working in the free state. And I was in Mozambique and I was, you know, very conscious that uh, the university there was trying to help the, the Ministry of Health to develop a death record. They didn't have a record of death. And um, and I said, wow, we should put you together. And, you know, we, we, we got them together. And from that, uh, we IDRC supported hacking hackathons, you know, and they would get together. And I have to say that um, it grew as a global. Um, I mean, Open MRS, just Google it. You'll see that it it it, it it's all over the world. Uh, these are these are medical professionals who have developed electronic medical records to help health systems. Um, you know, understand their um, their burdens of disease, understand their responsibilities, and so on. And this has grown because of connect, connecting people. You know, so for me, that's what knowledge networks are. We shouldn't be isolated. We shouldn't be siloed. And the irony you mentioned, COVID. The irony is that, I mean, I've worked with MUT now. I think I went there for one visit before COVID, and we've. We meet weekly. We meet online. We we get our work done. Um, we influence each other. We learn together. That's what I mean about knowledge networks. That we do not have to be isolated. We do not have to be, um, uh, you know, um, on our own in this uh, in, in this environment. And and the struggle obviously is how do we how do we incorporate more and more people um into into that the the benefits of the network right it's also it's what i'm hearing you say is also taking academic work and making it more um what is it i want to say edible but that, that's not the right word making like it more digestible thank you making it more digestible for people who live 
what we talk about in our papers. Mm. I would love to hear about your, your, your research network on ICT's impact on women. So how many organizations, what kind of work have they done? I think what, what is brilliant about your award is that Rhodes has recognized that, that women have made an impact in the history of the organization, I mean, history of the institution, as well as in South Africa and further abroad. So um, let me not, yeah, that's that's my pet project. So ICTs and women, what have you done? Uh, so here's a shout out to just a collection of people who were amazing and got this started. Uh, I want to think about, you know, APC network. Um, I want to think about Ina, Ina Kabaskins who trained me as a qualitative researcher and I and I, we invited her in to, to support the training of uh, a network of, of researchers. I want to think about... Um, and Webb, who's based here in Ottawa, and you know she was uh, the coordinator of that particular global project, uh, not global project, it was an Africa-wide project. And the book is called, it, 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 the network was called Grace, Gender Research in Africa on ICTs and Empowerment. And that book is still being cited. I mean, it's this work was done, I think, circa 2005, maybe. Um, but there, but this was a network of researchers who, uh, again, from Cape to Cairo, um, uh, interrogated uh, different case studies, uh, you know, to understand, um, you know, the benefits or not of, um, of access to ICTs uh, in, in various contexts. And I'm thinking now of Buchle, uh, who I think she's now the librarian at University of Pretoria, but she did this incredible piece where she looked at how students in Zimbabwe were, were um, women, you know, they had access to uh, library computers. And um, there were times when women just wouldn't even be there. Uh, they would leave. And through, through doing deep, you know, qualitative work, she was able to piece together the fact that actually women were experiencing harassment while they were waiting to access the computers. The men were harassing them. Now, who would have said that? We're talking about ICTs, we're talking about access, we're talking about neutral tools. Mm -hmm. They're not, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I, you know, I think, I, I mean, that's an incredible book. It's online. We did everything in open access. Everything I'm referring to that is uh, published can be uh, found on, on the internet. So if, if anybody's interested in the, as I said, that book is still being, still being cited because of the depth of qualitative research that they did, asking the questions beyond the evidence, you know, seeking evidence beyond what was, what okay. was, what was, yeah. clear, what was in, in our faces. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I mean, a, a, another case study that was done there was, uh, you know, the access that women in Morocco had to um, what they call ju juris juristical services. So, you know, women in Morocco who might have uh, been in um, uh, abusive relationships um, have found it really difficult to leave uh, their homes. And, uh, you know, there's this incredible quote in the book where the woman said, you know, at one stage it was me and my phone and God, you know. So, um, I mean, that the, the, the kind of intervention that they were trying to create was a safe space, a safe place for women to retreat to, uh, which were the ju jurid juridical centers. But the, but the question was how, you know, how were these women, how were they safe? Were they safe? So it's really, uh, how can I put it, um, digging deeper, understanding beyond the access, what the issues were that people were encountering because of, uh, you know, new forms of yeah. communications. We, we need more, more research like that in all aspects of, of life and development because the numbers don't often tell the whole story. And exactly. so, yeah. I, I want to, I'm, I'm very aware of the time because we have two minutes to go, but um, I want to make a comment about the fact that you are in the North as a Northern researcher academic in a Northern institution, and yet you are an insider informant as an African woman who has roots in Africa. So I think that is one of, that probably drives a lot of your research as well. 
Um, I actually, my I'm not an academic. <laughs> I I've trained no, now. As, <laughs> I I facilitate research funding for academics. Um, and um, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I mean, my boss is here today, Karen Schwartz. She's the Vice President Research and International at Carleton University. And my role is to really facilitate international connections, international consortia. And as you can hear, I, I mean, that, that's my, my stuff, right? So I love doing that. And, um, and I love putting the right people together because they, they form an alchemy and they, um, you know, the, the, the whole is always greater than its part. So um, uh, my role at Carlton uh, continues to be to support uh, researchers, but also to, to get funding, which uh, we've, we've, we're using the Queen Elizabeth scholarships um, to support. Uh, at, and this year we're doing, uh, this season, we're doing it just for women, uh, women PhD candidates or early career uh, researchers in West Africa who, um, who, who can't get away to finish their PhD. So we're creating a room of their own, Wurren Tarana Rubutu, which is the name of our project. Um, and it's to, to create a connection with someone at Carlton who's a supervisor and give them also an opportunity with a partnership in, uh, in West Africa, uh, Canadian NGOs that are based in West Africa, uh, and or here in Canada, hopefully we'll be able to get people to travel soon, but for now it's virtual. And it's that it's those kinds of connections that uh, to me, um, you know, breathe um, development, <laughs> support and co-development of um, a world that, um, that I want to be part of, <laughs> you know. I, I, I thought about it yesterday that, uh, you know, well, we have to be the change we want to we wanna be, you know, we have to be the change we want to see. So um, Gandhi famously said that and, and, you know, that's my, my contribution, I guess. That's a great place to end. Thank you so much for allowing me to spend some remote time with you and to get to know your story. You said it was going to be a storytelling session. So I really enjoyed hearing your experiences um, and, and hearing about the projects that you've been working on. So thank you very much. Nontobeko, back to you. Can I, can I just say, you know, a, just a final word of gratitude. I, I'm grateful that this platform allowed me to tell those stories. And um, I'm really grateful to Rhodes. And I'm grateful to you all for making it such a pleasant experience thank you and thank you to my family my friends my husband who keeps nourishing me with tea and keeps me going at my standing desk <laughs> my kids who have both made it into this world of ICTs and are doing, being change makers so I just want to acknowledge that and I want to say thank you thank you Rhodes thank you Dorothea thank you thank you Eloise thank you Eloise Absolutely beautiful. Can you see what women get up to when they are locked in the same virtual meeting? Come on, <laughs> come on, man. Thank you so much, Dr. Reyes, for taking us home. What a beautiful and empowering conversation. Thank you so much, Eloise, for so much nostalgia, so much agency, and so much importance in the work that you do. We can clearly see that there's definitely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, more than many reasons that you are, of course, 2021's distinguished alumni. We love you so much. We appreciate your work. And the beautiful thing for me that I'll take from you, I can see it comes from so far deep. It comes from such a beautiful source, and I cannot help but be inspired in my own passion. So thank you, thank you so, so much for that. And I'm not the, I'm not the only one um, who wants to throw congratulations uh, along your way. Um, our Rhodes University Registrar also came through and saying, congratulations, Heloise, looking forward to this conversation. And that was really at the very beginning from our Registrar. And of course, a familiar name to you, Lex Henning saying, daddy would be very proud of you today. Well done, sister. I don't want you to cry anymore, but I think, <laughs> I think it's happening. <laughs> 
And of course, uh, Peter Clayton coming through saying, hey, hey, Louise, a warm congratulations. I'm absolutely loving this conversation. And, um, and lastly, Tina saying, well-deserved, hey, Louise, congratulations. You played a significant role in ICT4D in the region. You were passionate, questioning, challenging many of us with your thoughts, insights, and actions. And of course, our VC thanking, wrapping up and thanking everyone, particularly on that platform. So thank you, thank you so, so much, Heloise. And of course, the amazing people that were part of today's um, panel, Dr. Dorothy Hendricks, thank you, because without you and nominating and the whole people that co-nominated, we wouldn't be celebrating today. So thank you so much. Thank you to the VC. And of course, everyone within the Rhodes University family. And um, of course, the person leading the conversation today, Dr. Reiters. I'll just look across the board and ask if anyone has any last goodbyes that they would like to share. I see the VC coming through. Hey, Louise, I know you've said some goodbyes, but I don't know if there's anything else. I'm checking. Are we all good? I, I, I just want to say um, there are many people who, in my written speech, I wanted to acknowledge, you know, Laura Elder, Steve Song, Mike Jensen, People who were, you know, network and people who made the network for me at, at IDRC so pleasant. But, but most of all, we're all grieving today because the rich is passing, and we just send our love to Claire and his network. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for exactly that. Thank you so much for every one of you joining us on all the different corners of the world. Thank you for honoring this moment and this virtual discussion with us. If you missed out, I don't know how, you can simply go onto the Rhodes University YouTube platform where you can get a full on of the conversation, not just today's one, but the whole series as we've navigated through 2021. Don't forget you can join us again on the 30th of November where we pass on the baton from Heloise to our next alumni and having a beautiful enrich conversation with our distinguished alumni for 2021. Just to remind you all that this particular series has been brought to you by Rhodes University's Division for Communication and Advancements, simply fostering productive lifelong relationships with our alumni. And of course, a big thank you to also the beautiful team behind the scene, Mandy Laike, Missy Corner, and of course, Tammy also. Thank you so much. We appreciate the amazing work that's being done. And uh, to everyone at home, Nibe Nosugolu, Tanda, Thank you so much, Heloise. And for the last time, halala, halala, halala. Halala, halala. The Zandagandini, all you have to do is just so. Thank you so much. Halala, Heloise, halala. Take it, it is yours. Thank you so much, everyone else, for going home. Dorothea, thank you so much. We love thank you. Thank you, Nonto Beko. <laughs> thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.